In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Jesus um, taught in parables and explained everything in private to the disciples. In the first three chapters of, of Mark's gospel, they're filled with Jesus' doing healing someone with a withered hand, um, coming up out of the water in his own baptism. In chapter four, we have four parables, and um, each one more interesting than the next. But the first bit, why is it that Jesus would tell stories um, to the crowds and then only explain what the stories meant to those who who were his, his who became his disciples, I can tell you what I think, um, and I think two things. One is that one of the things I've learned over twenty five years as a preacher is one of the worst things you can do is to tell a wonderful story and then destroy it by telling everybody what it means. A story, a parable is meant to engage. It's meant to cause the hearer to kind of scratch their head and say, wonder what, the, gee, does it mean this? Does it mean that? Sounds lovely. It's interesting, but I don't quite get it. Why is Jesus attempting to be exclusionary or hierarchical? No. Jesus preaches to the crowds in a way that allows him to determine who is really interested in hearing what he has to say, who is genuinely interested in a deeper understanding. So he tells wonderful parables to the crowds, and they get something from it. But it's only those who come forward, you know, if you've ever been to a lecture, uh, you know, or a talk, and you know, uh, uh, at the end of the talk, a line of people form up in front of the lectern to ask specific questions of, of the speaker that they've had during the course of the talk. Some of them, of course, line up to show off how smart they are and how they really understood what was going on, but that's another sermon. Um, Jesus wants people to self-select. He wants to open the deeper ministries of the kingdom of God to those who truly desire to hear it and then therefore in some ways are ready to hear it. We hear also in the Gospels, let those who have ears to hear, hear. Well, that sounds offhanded, but it isn't. It's another way of saying, are you listening? Are you listening? Do you hear what I'm saying as the expression goes these days? So, so the first point I want to make is pray for the gift to be among those who really want to understand, who really want to engage with his teaching about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is and what the kingdom of God involves and how the kingdom of God evolves and emerges. Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, in the first parable today, I just ask you to notice as you engage with the parable yourself that A, Jesus seemed to pick parables out of what was around him. You know, he was walking through grain fields. He was you know, with fishermen by the Sea of Galilee. And so his parables came from the immediate experience of the people around him. It's why we have trouble sometimes understanding them, because that was 2,000 years ago in a different culture and a different language, and we have to do what we can. It's the preacher's job, really, to try and bridge that kind of a gap. So as you look 
to engage in the first of these parables, notice simply these things, that the farmer plants the seeds. And then the farmer goes about the farmer's business and the seeds and the earth and the rain interact and growth occurs basically without any more assistance from the farmer. And only in the end, at the harvest, does the farmer become active again. Think of how many plants grow on the earth that no human being has ever tended. How seeds move through the atmosphere. And um, um, uh, my wife Marie is over by the river today attacking invasive species. Um, that are hurting some of the trees and, and, and things here in our neighborhood. But I tease her. I say, did they come from Earth or did they come from outer space? If they came from Earth, they're not invasive. She usually rolls her eyes at about that point. Because I know what she means and she knows what I mean. Okay. So, so what would you say if you were explaining to one of your children if you were explaining to someone who had never heard about Christianity before and they wanted to, they had read this bit and Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. What would you say to them? What would you draw? On? What parable would you draw on? What story would you tell to help open their hearts and their minds to get some inkling, some curiosity about what this kingdom of God was all about. Hmm? I'd like you to think about that this week. I certainly think about it a lot. And the second parable today, the mustard seed. And again, not to tell you what it means, but just to observe. It's the smallest of all seeds. I don't know whether that's literally true or not. I don't know about mustard seeds, but I'll take his word for it. And yet a huge bush grows. When I heard that this week, what I thought of was how frequently God seems to start out with something really small. A small change in your life or in mine. A small insight, um, a small experience, nothing that Cecil B. DeMille would ever make a film over and you older folks can explain to the younger folks who Cecil B. DeMille was. Nothing dramatic, something very small, okay? A chance remark, a chance meeting that then somehow grows and matures quietly into something quite extraordinary, quite beyond anything that would have been beyond the wildest dreams of those who first saw the planting. Think about how many times in your life some important relationship began with a chance meeting, with a small comment, with a little joke that was shared. Think about how many times something really important was seeded in your experience by a throwaway remark or something that didn't seem to have very much significance at the time, but upon reflection turned out to have great significance. In December, Marie and I will be married. I can't remember whether it's 51 or 52 years. Don't tell her I said that. Um, I met her because I was dating a friend of hers. And she just happened to stop by to say hello while we were having lunch together. And then I just happened to run into her at a party a couple of weeks later. And... Um, to say that I was not one of the cool kids would be, you know, to exaggerate. But I had learned, because it was the 60s, um, 
I liked to sing and I could carry a tune. And I realized all the cool guys played guitar. And that's who all the really cool girls were interested in. So I got myself a guitar and I learned to play three chords. So I could sit up with the guys, you know, at the parties who were strumming along and I could sing. And I just pretended to strum more than I knew. And there she was. And, and like I said, I was not a very cool kid. And um, so I had developed like one pickup line. And so I said to her, probably after more glasses of wine than I should have had. So what would it take for you to consider to marry me? And without missing a beat, the then Marie Jones looked at me and said, well, I couldn't possibly consider marrying anybody who didn't bring me yellow roses. Well, a short time later, we arranged to have lunch on a Saturday and we were both poor as church mice. Um, I didn't have much money at all, but I very clearly remember borrowing money from my roommate and everybody that would lend me money. I didn't know exactly why, but I showed up with a dozen yellow roses. And out of that small, those small seedlings and planted a whole life together, grew and mature and developed. I want you to think about those experiences in your life. And in particular, think about those things that have led you to be here with us this Sunday morning on Zoom in church, worshiping our Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for the coming down of the Holy Spirit. How is it that the seeds of faith were planted in you? Where did they come from? What were they? Do you know how the growth happened? Or did it just seem to happen and then one day, there it was? Let those of you who have ears to hear, hear. Amen. Amen.